So uh, today I'm going to talk to you about checklists. So my name's Jay. I work at Microsoft. If you want to find me on Twitter, it's at Jay Destro. It's pretty easy. I'm pretty online. Um, so let's let's talk about checklists. Um, and uh, to give you some background, uh, before I worked at Microsoft, uh, I worked at some pretty cool places. Uh, BuzzFeed saw some of the biggest traffic that they've ever had. In the history of that website, DigitalOcean saw scale uh, and worked at a place that eventually became Rackspace. So today we're going to talk about checklists. And they're really a way to help keep you making sure you're actually going to do what it is you say you're going to do. It's, it's a really simple concept of creating checklists to uh, ensure that we're, we're accomplishing our goals. And um, there's a really great book that uh, you can read, and, and here's a quote from it. And it's, under conditions of complexity, not only are checklists a help, but they are required for success. It makes a lot of sense. And checklists are some of the first ways that we actually create plans. And if you think back to childhood and being, you know, getting ready for school in the morning or making sure your homework's done, you know, they help us organize ideas uh, from the earliest time. So I'm going to tell you a quick story. Um, we had this really cool shuttle program uh, here in the United States. And it was almost about, I guess, for 40 years. And in that 40 years, you better believe there were a hell of a lot of checklists. Um, in order to launch a giant uh, shuttle into space carrying tons and tons of liquid uh, fuel and uh, a a few other really important pieces of equipment, you're going to want to go through a series of checklists. Now, uh, NASA, to prepare for these missions, um, they would have to go through every single piece of equipment that uh, was going up. And the typical payload was somewhere near around 6,000 pounds. Packing for these missions uh, would require Troy Mann and his team to go through every single item that was a part of, say, a spacesuit. Make sure that every single piece in the 200 pounds of equipment that was in that spacesuit was actually uh, accounted for. Uh, it was sealed, dry, and, and, and you knew where it is. Because you have to remember, the average shuttle trip, you had to carry along tons and tons of food. Uh, you had to know where all the food was. You had to ensure everything was dry, working, uh, available. Because you don't want to get in a situation where you're up there and you're looking for scientific equipment and you're like, sorry, we don't have that. What do you mean? It wasn't on the list. So that's really why you have to kind of consider lists. Uh, and, and so let's get on to the next story. And the next story has to do with a pretty big rock band. Some of us have heard of this story. And uh, it's, it's kind of important to uh, making sure that things go to plan. So uh, the last time I did this talk, I did a, uh, a really loud shout. So I'm going to try it again. Panama! Yeah, well, you remember Van Halen. They did that song, Panama, and a whole bunch of other things. And uh, they went out on tour in uh, 1982. And when they went on tour in 1982, they put out this concert writer. And concert writers essentially say, these are the things that have to happen between my band and your, organ uh, your venue for the show to go great. Um, so uh, there was a notorious part about their writer. And in the writer, it said, uh, we want no brown M&Ms in a bowl full of M&Ms. Now, a lot of people thought this was diva nonsense, but it really wasn't. It was actually a way to create a checklist because you have to look at the amount of things that were going on. They had some of the largest production that was ever done in the history of a rock show. You know, 80 sold out dates, millions of watts of sound. And, and the idea was the brown M&M existed to ensure that no matter what, they read everything and they got everything correct. So if you plan, you should build your own brown M&M into your deployment process. And, and it's not that different from what you're doing when it comes to deploying applications. So, you know, think about it. Have you checked everything into a repository? Um, have you configured monitoring and is that monitoring secure? Uh, or I should say, are, are your ports configured and are those ports secured? And do you have an on-call rotation set? So there are ways for you to consider uh, how to create a checklist and, and processes to use. I like to think of using, say, GitHub issues or maybe even creating a Kanban board of a thing that you know has to happen. So document the procedure. Make a list, make it twice, and keep checking it and make sure that you create your own brown M&M into your deployment process. That's Rico. He's really cool. This is how to find me. Uh, thanks a lot for letting me talk to you all. Have a good one.
Hey, everybody. OK, for the next five minutes, you're the boss of a company not doing DevOps yet. What if I said to you, it's safe and possible to release my work to customers at any time? Would you be able to say the same? You might have your own questions and concerns before you answer. On reflection, you might consider that it's probably not at all safe to release your work straight to the customer. Something beyond your control might break. You might say something like, well, I'm not trusted to release my work at any time, or I don't trust others to release their work at any time. Additionally, there may be other procedure in place that make releasing work at any time problematic. Each one of these concerns yield great team discussion about ways to make things safer, or to increase trust, or to streamline processes. As concerns are discussed, we start to move closer to, maybe it is possible to release our work at any time. But many teams inevitably reach a seemingly unsolvable problem. Consider being a member of the development team all the way to the left in the process, with teams and phases sitting firmly between you and the customers at the other end. Of course, you'll never deliver your work straight to them this way. <clears throat> now, a batch of new work is sent to your development team, who completes it as quickly as they can, delivering it to the next team to do something like functional testing, after which, if successful, the batch goes on to performance testing, and so on. These phases vary between organizations, but this is roughly the situation. Eventually, the batch of work makes it to an operations team responsible for deploying the batch into a production environment for customers to use. Anybody, anybody seen this situation? So an idea originally intended to delight customers enters development as a large batch of work. But it must make its way through the entire process before being delivered to customers months later or longer. The problem here is batching. It's intuitive to think that if we are given all of our work at once, then we'll be able to focus and get very fast, completing the whole batch efficiently passing it all on to the next group to do the same. This strategy is batch it up and be the fastest at processing your batch. We can test this strategy in a simple and cheap exercise using only pennies and a timer. For this exercise, we have 20 pennies and a customer that needs their pennies to be flipped four times. Of course, they'd like to receive fully flipped pennies as soon as possible. Starting with a batch of 20 pennies and a penny flipper for each time the pennies need to be flipped, we can simulate all 20 pennies being flipped once, then passed on to be flipped a second time. Only after all 20 pennies are flipped a fourth and final time does the customer start to receive their fully flipped pennies. With this batch size, they get all of the pennies all at once. What a nice big release. Typically, the batch of pennies can be flipped four times in about two minutes. Since all pennies are delivered at once, the customer gets their first and last of the 20 pennies at the same time in about two minutes. If you run this exercise with two batches of 10 pennies or four batches of five pennies, the customer gets their pennies faster and faster. Doing one penny at a time, essentially a batch of one, yields significantly faster deliveries. Doing one penny at a time means one penny is flipped and passed for its second flipping, then for the third and fourth, and delivered to the customer with the rest of the pennies flipping in right behind the first. Done this way, the first penny is delivered to the customer in about five seconds. Further, the customer continues to receive pennies until the 20th penny arrives at approximately 30 seconds. This is a big deal. By reducing the batch size to one, the customer starts receiving value in five seconds instead of the original two minutes and then they receive everything originally asked for in 30 seconds instead of the original two minutes. That's a big dis difference for the customer. So we can prove through this exercise that there's a much faster way to deliver value to our customers. And DevOps is how we do this, by essentially flipping the old process to release smaller batches more frequently. By having everyone on the same team necessary to release work and keeping our batches of work very small, our teams can deliver value to our customers more frequently and significantly sooner. Automated testing and continuous integration are only two examples of methods to help achieve our improved collaborative focus on better product development and delivery to our customers. DevOps transforms teams, allowing their definition of done to include putting value in our customers' hands. This is what DevOps is about, and this is why we do it. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, if you didn't see me, my talk yesterday, I'm John Sowers. At this moment, you're all paying attention to me. And you're probably not paying attention to yourselves. The spotlight of your attention is incredibly powerful, and it allows you to basically ignore everything else that you're not actively paying attention to. It allows you to ignore your body. It allows you to ignore your emotions. It even allows you to ignore some of your thoughts. So with all of your attention on me, you're not paying attention to yourselves or to the people around you. So I'm going to ask you to stop paying attention to me. Refocus your attention on yourself for a little while. Sometimes it's helpful to close your eyes to do this. And you may find that once you're doing this, suddenly you're noticing things that you weren't paying attention to before, things that are going on with you that you didn't notice before. Messages from your body, thoughts you were trying not to think, feelings maybe you were trying to avoid. So some of the feelings you might notice are maybe you're really excited at how well this conference has gone. Or maybe you're really exhausted from all the travel you've been doing and all the people you've been talking to. You may notice sensations, such as how sore your butt is from sitting in these chairs all day. Or you might notice that one of your shoulders is kind of higher than the other one, and it's been like that for a couple of days. Or maybe they're just parts of your body that are tense. How do your feet feel? What does the floor feel like underneath the soles of your shoes? Is your bag too heavy? You may notice sounds in the room too. The refrigerator back at the bar, people shifting in their seats, the hum of the lights. Or maybe you're feeling really relaxed and comfortable and at ease. Your belly's full from lunch and you're really enjoying what you're doing right now. And I point these things out not to say that they're good or bad or that you should do anything about any of them, but just to bring them into your awareness. Because that's the wonderful thing about awareness. It suddenly gives you choice. You can decide what to do once you're aware of these things going on. And this is an exercise in developing what's called mindfulness, which is simply the skill of being aware of what's going on at this moment. Think of it as a stand-up meeting for your senses, both internal and external. Everything gets to report in, and you can see what things need attention, what things need new decisions. So once you decide, once you know what's going on, you can decide, should it keep going on, or should I make a change? It's so easy to get caught up in the flow of things and just go from one thing to the next to the next, and not really step back and reassess. Is this the actual direction I want to be going right now? So stepping back into what you're feeling currently, what's going on with you physically and mentally and emotionally, can help you re-decide what the best direction forward is. And I've got a few slides left that are just going to keep going. So let's just sit and be aware of where we are right now. Thank you so much. If you're
curious at all about more to find more about mindfulness and the science behind it, you can check out this URL. There are also like a million other resources out there. So there you go. Hello. How's everyone doing so far? Good? Yeah. All right. <laughs> so hands, imposter syndrome, anybody? Suffers? Yeah, a good chunk of the room. Okay, so I got 15 seconds for that. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, so this hopefully will help you guys uh, out a little bit. Um, so my name is Lawrence Shea. I've been a PHP developer, not too many of you guys here, uh, for seven years working for Verizon for the last two. Um, I do have imposter syndrome, although I am not an imposter because I have imposter syndrome, and I'm going to explain that uh, through the other slides. So first off, I'm not a doctor. The story, um, this is my story and what has helped me, so it's not medical advice. <laughs> Just wanna make sure that's very clear. <clears throat> yeah. Well, that's a lot, long time on this one. All right, so what is imposter syndrome? Imposter syndrome is a psychological pattern in which an individual doubts their accomplishments and has a persistent internalized fear of being exposed as a fraud. Um, for sure I've experienced this and based on the hands we've got quite a few people in the audience like this. So I wanted to be a great software developer. I didn't have a degree or anyone to guide me, so I started on a path of rapid learning. I started following news blogs like Medium, following the developers everyone thought were the best on social media, and this was pretty good. I learned what I needed and got to work. Um, in only a few months, I was following hundreds of people on social media. I was inundated with exceptionalism. I bought a house with my ebook money. My OSS project just went over a million downloads. I just sold my SaaS project for a million dollars. You know, lots of exceptionalism here. And I started to think to myself, uh, you know, I got this picture of what success looked like, but how could I possibly compare to these people? Uh, why do I bother? What am I doing wrong? I don't have this level of success, and I'm not even coming close. So I must be an imposter. <clears throat> So people that don't care don't have imposter syndrome. We all know that guy at work, nine to five, goes home, cracks a beer, Netflix and chill. No problems, no issues, no imposter syndrome. <laughs> so it's people that don't care that don't have imposter syndrome. Um, it is because you care that you have imposter syndrome. It is because you're trying so hard to be good at what you do that you set your, the bar for yourself so high. It's the simple fact that you have imposter syndrome that proves that you are, not, uh, you are not in fact an imposter. And the rest of this talk is advice that I've heard, read, or been told that has worked for me. And I'm not a unicorn. You know, the only, I'm not the only person to overcome this. If I can do it, you can do it better and faster. Or at least that's the hope. <laughs> so if you're beating yourself up because of that ebook you haven't written yet, ask yourself if being an author is really what you want. Did you really just want to be successful? And if so, you can accomplish that without being an author. Decide what to care about. <clears throat> So we have a finite amount of uh, time and energy, and if we narrow down the things that we care about, we can spend more of our limited resources on the things that truly matter to us. Um, since we don't care about that ebook, we now have more time to work on that side project. <clears throat> so just because the list of things that, aren't import that are important to you right now does not include an ebook, that doesn't mean that you'll never write one. In fact, there's a phenomenon called the backwards law that may end up making your ebook better later than it ever could be now. So the harder we try with the conscious will to do something, the less we shall succeed. Now this is a quote from Aldous Huxley, a very famous author, Brave New World. Basically, he's not saying don't try. He's just saying there's diminishing returns on trying. So you know, if you're really trying so hard to get some things done, if you take a step back, sometimes it helps. So um, for example, when I got my job at Verizon, I stopped caring about JavaScript. And after two years, I revisited JavaScript for a side project, and I was better at it despite having ignored it because I, can't, I became a better developer in that time. Um, so some things that'll help you out, focus on accomplishments, not failures. Start a success journal. Set aside time each day to reflect upon your accomplishments and write them down. And understand that often today's failure will lead to tomorrow's success. Uh, success. Uh, focus on your accomplishments and don't beat yourself up. Treat yourself like someone you care about. Change how you talk about yourself in your own head. Be positive in your own thinking. Instead of being an imposter, you can be an expert in training or a famous person yet to be discovered. You know, again, focus on accomplishments, not failures. Uh, get involved with the local community. Uh, we're all here now, but you can get involved, uh, you know, attending meetups or user groups. Start one if you need to. Uh, when you're surrounded by your peers, especially when others come to you for advice, you might just realize you're not the imposter that you think you are. Um, you know, imposter syndrome is about the fear of being called out as a fraud. In the first four years of my career, I freelanced, and to be a fraud meant literally to possibly lose my income. 
Um, being a part of a user group or meetup is a safe space to ask questions and be wrong sometimes. So that's imposter syndrome. You have it, so you aren't. Thank you very much. I hope this was helpful for you guys.